Welcome to HD Nation, your guide to the best in HD content and the best in home theater gear, no matter what your budget is. I'm Patrick Norton. Hey, and I'm Robert Heron. We've got a ton of good stuff coming up for you in today's show. But first, let us talk the glory of custom lengths. Well, actually, not custom lengths, but various lengths of HDMI cables from little to giant. Just let me I, look at this monster. 75 feet. And apparently, this is from monoprice.com. I was shopping there last night, had it delivered today. A 75 foot single run of HDMI cable that features a built in equalizer because. Normally, you can't run cable that long, an HDMI cable that long, without some help, and there's the help right Equalizer there. Equalizer or booster? A little bit of both, probably. It's uh, correcting the signal so that by huh. the time it's coming out the other end, it should be good to go. Uh, it's got an adjustment on there for dialing and how much boost you need for the signal. And I'm going to be running 1080i signal through that, right. so I'm not trying to push 1080p or anything like that. But they do make these excessively long runs if you need one. They even had a 100-footer if I needed that. But just to show the difference, it's like, yeah, you. There are 75 foot cables, but mm -hmm. if I had a, a device stacked on top of the other, that's where that one foot cable would come in handy. And likewise, a two, well, me, a two meter cable or a six footer, six and a half footer, lots of good options for HDMI cable. Use the appropriate length where needed. Yeah, I mean, these are fantastic. If you yeah. have, you know, your, your, your amplifier above your Blu-ray player, above whatever <laughs> comes next, right? Put your amp on top, because the heat from the amp will kill the Blu-ray player. These are great for keeping things from being completely, insanely disorganized. Cable management is so much easier in your media stack with one or two foot cables. Totally, even, even a two meter cable is a little long for something that's stacked right on top of each other. How much does a 75 foot amplified HDMI cable cost. I want to say it was about a buck a foot, okay. uh, maybe a little bit less. I think it was about 60, 70 bucks. For so this. that was so. probably less expensive than running Ethernet and Balins. But if you're looking for like a freaking 400 foot length, do yeah. the Ethernet Balin thing. Yeah, um, that, that is a great solution. You can use those adapters that turn an Ethernet connection into an HDMI connection, and vice versa. And then you can cut and and, and cap your own Ethernet cables at will. Right. Unlike HDMI, where you have to buy it with a terminated end on it. So. <laughs> Other options there too, but just realize there are really long runs of HDMI out there and very short ones too, depending on what you're doing. Get the length most appropriate for you. Big shock, <laughs> HBO Go got hammered like a narc at a biker rally at the premiere night of Game of Thrones. Kind of like the it's, conclusion it's the of shiny True sunglasses. Detective. Um, there's a kind of snotty article on Gizmodo. If you want to watch Game of Thrones, maybe just pay for it. Ironically, I know at least two people who pay for. Um, a subscription to HBO? HBO, and could not access it online uh, because of the enormous amount of traffic. But generally speaking, um, you know, I think HBO has decided they're going to serve as much traffic as they serve. And if you don't get it, we're really sorry, business traveler, or we're really <laughs> sorry, uh, dude who streams HBO because he won't pay for the monthly fee to get the HD box from his cable company. Um, but it's funny, though. Like, like You're HBO reminding me to call my mom to get her password so I can add that to my collection of... <laughs> Of streaming goodness. Yeah, you, you might just I'm going to help make the, the problem episode. worse. That's what I'm going to do. It's, <laughs> he's a giver, people. Oh, my goodness. Amazon Fire TV. I'm yeah. Gonna show you, well, okay, so we have, the, there we go, art from a set-top box. Amazon Fire TV came out last week. We told you about that. This is a fast uh, media streaming box with an interesting future as in Android gaming, uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. It's a coaster, like we said last week. It is a little tiny black box. This is the entire uh, Fire TV box. And from what I understand from people that have ripped it open, it is mostly heat sink and silicon inside of this critter. Um, there's a speedy 1.7 gigahertz quad-core Snapdragon processor along with an Adreno 320 GPU. That's pretty powerful for a set-top box. In part because, well, Amazon is all about this little button right here. Great Bluetooth remote, uh, which was a big plus to me. I like oh, well so you remote. could hide that box you out of sight. You could hide that box, nice. yes. Yeah. See that, though? This remote is all about that microphone, which is all about voice search. And let me pull up the Fire Operating System, Amazon's version of Android. Bam. Phineas and Ferb. It's thinking, and it's pulling up the exact thing I'm looking for. Um, so. If you are a, a, if you run one of Amazon's tablets, this is all going to look really, really familiar. When I hit the home button, um, Amazon's Android is not as clean as Roku or, or, or Apple TV in terms of the interface, but like I said, it's familiar to Fire users. And so we go in here, we got TV, we got our watch list, we got our video library. Um, they're, you know, they made a big deal. There's like 24 kind of basic apps in here. Uh, I was kind of laughing when I fired it up. So this is like, Showtime Anytime? Watch ESPN? What? Yes. Um, but those are all kind of preloaded, and you can eliminate them. Um, search and browsing this is really fast, and the voice search works to a point. For example, let me search for uh, Justified. Thinking. I go for Justified, and look, right? I'm getting all these options that involve, like, gunslinging mayhem. This is the one I want, Tim V. Oliphant, Justified. Season 5 is fantastic. Nice. Um, 
no, season four, I guess we're watching right now. But notice something about this. It's like, okay, I can buy season one, but you know what? If I go here to more ways to watch, oh, it's also available with Amazon Prime, which is an Amazon Prime customer, which I'm signed into on this. I get it for free. This box is definitely about Amazon people, but as you notice, it's about Amazon making money. Um, you had to click a couple times to get to the free option. Yeah, it's it wasn't, kind of... It wasn't defaulting to that by your login only. It's kind of funny how that works. And you want to use voice search, right? Because if you go into the search button, they really want you to use voice search. Because you go to search, it's like voice search, press and hold the microphone. Uh, if you want to go to text search, you actually have to manually click up to text search. And I can go in there. Oh, look, let's go to... Gee, does this feel slow? Because everything else in this, on this interface feels fast until I start clicking through this particular menu, right? And I still get justified. Um, the carousels kind of take forever. So that's kind of the big Amazon Android thing. Let's go to the home and let's go to recently added to Prime. And so I get these. And normally I would be scrolling these by on a tablet, but let's keep going because there's like recently added, and I'm still looking at recently added, and I get to 50, 70, 65, 70, 78 titles, and oh, they're just, yeah, I have to scroll <laughs> all the way back if I want to do that. It's kind of frustrating. Oh. It doesn't go back to the beginning like the Roku interface does. Oh. Even that works a little bit better than Wi-Fi. Um, one of the things that Android's working on is the advanced stream and prediction, ASAP. Uh, it's supposed to preload videos, uh, well, Amazon videos you're going to watch. The next episode of a series, for example, I think it's kind of a work in progress. And a lot of stuff on this uh, box is a work in progress. The Amazon stuff is pretty fantastic, but moving away from Amazon, let's say I load Netflix, and it's like pretty much all the non-Amazon apps look like generic sort of Android-y, Google TV-ish, you know, We grab Apple. the code and put it in, but it hasn't been yeah. polished a little bit, so well, to speak. Well, it's not awful, but you notice that everything feels, everything that's not Amazon feels slower. I don't think they're, uh, they've been really optimized for this. Uh, and of course, look, Justified brings us back to Justified. This is good. And we're back into Amazon. So it won't, the, the cool voice search feature doesn't work uh, on the non-Amazon applications. HBO Go, no signs of uh, yet. Pandora, iHeartRadio, yep. It's like 24 channels compared to Roku's thousands. And a lot of people are like, well, Roku has like 3,000 channels. The thing is, most Roku users aren't watching all 900 church channels on the Roku application. Love that they're there. Great, easy platform to publish to. Um, but the basics, I think Amazon has covered. You know, I would like to see Voodoo. I would like to see Crunchyroll uh, as an anime fan. But the basics are there. The app works. Um, but the real kind of secret feature of this, if I was Ouya, you know, the Android gaming company, someday I will get back to the home screen. Where's my is. Twitch TV? <laughs> well, that's what I want. Games on this are really, really serious. Fire TV is going to be awesome for Android gaming. Um, there's a lot of games where you need the Fire uh, a game controller. It's 40 bucks or another Bluetooth compatible remote control for some games. Unfortunately, we didn't have the Moga Pro because our inexpensive Moga uh, Bluetooth. Uh, remote would not work with this or controller would not work with this um, but apparently they're talking about like multiplayer continue from last checkpoint yes um, so right now we've only done gaming with the remote control but they're talking about multiplayer for up to five people although my understanding is no split screen yet and the graphics now obviously this is the most challenging interface or game but the graphics actually look really good in like part high-end tablet hardware effectively in that box. Yes. And because it's a little bit bigger than your average mobile device, it's probably running at a slightly higher clock rate than you're going to get out of most mobile devices. Yeah. So it's, it should be at least as good as the best handheld stuff right now. It's pretty good. I was actually kind of impressed. I didn't get to play as many things as I would have liked. Um, but here, um, Amazon. <laughs> if it can't get this, yeah, well. <laughs> in any case, um, there's no free time from the Fire tablets yet, so you'll need to kind of watch the kids on this. There are parental controls, but they're not as sophisticated as I would like. And I should point out, none of the parental controls on any set-top box are as sophisticated as I would like. Um, kind of amplifies, this is just like early Apple TV and uh, early Roku. And, well, the early versions of the 30 other streaming media boxes out there. It's a work in progress. The Amazon experience is pretty awesome. If you don't have Amazon Prime or a Fire tablet or want to move your entire life on Amazon video streaming, this is not your box yet. If you already own a fairly new Roku or Apple TV, this is not your box. If you have most of your life tied up in the Google Play Store or the iTunes Store, this is not your box. If you're all about Amazon, this is a badass box. $99 available now, um, $39 for the Amazon remote control if you don't have another uh, Bluetooth compatible remote, excuse me, the Amazon game controller. Yeah. I'm just gonna say that clearly. 
Amazon controller or Amazon Fire controller, since apparently I, I want to call it a remote. See, there it is, the I'm Amazon a, Fire game controller. Hearing a lot of people comment that if you like the Xbox controller, the classic one, you'll mm -hmm. like this controller as well. It, it, it obviously has a similar design for the analog stick placement, but nice to see, though. And, and something I wouldn't mind having just for computer use, but yeah. Well, it's kind of, I, I will say props to Amazon on one hand for basically saying, hey, uh, you know, if you need a controller, uh, they're pretty explicit about that, that a game won't work without a controller. The, the downside, though, is the, the Amazon.com slash MFK controllers doesn't resolve to a list of controllers with information. It resolves to the Amazon Fire game controller purchase page. Um, okay. <laughs> well, it's kind of funny, right? So, But if you do go into settings... We'll give you an option. Yeah, we'll, we'll give you an option. <laughs> if you dig down into the settings and go to controllers uh, and go to Bluetooth oh, cool. game pads, then they give you kind of, you maybe might be able to find it to work. Disclosure, Amazon is in Fire TV, owns our sponsor, audiblepodcast.com slash HDNation. Audible's incredible collection of spoken word entertainment is available on a staggering array of hardware, not just the delightful Apple Fire TV. And there's 150,000 titles, so you can say, listen to the unabridged Game of Thrones novels on your daily commute, since you can watch them on HBO Go. Uh, and you can listen to that 20 minutes at a time for the next few years, because they're too damn long. Get a free audiobook just for being an HD Nation fan at audiblepodcast.com slash HDNation. It would be better if you're clever. You can even figure out how to watch it on the fire, uh, comma Amazon, comma TV. Very, very cool. It's I, it's it's a nice box, but you know what? There's like 30 other nice set-top boxes right now, or media streaming devices. Quite a few. And More coming. And yeah, too many. Too many. The market many is officially choices. fragmented. Not like Bluetooth speaker fragmented, but close to there. Going back to the home theater, PC. Thank you very much. Dave from Sacramento, California wrote us to ask a very good calibration question. Robert or Patrick, I recently purchased a DVDO Edge Green and was wondering where I calibrate the settings, on the Edge or on the TV? Since both have the ability to adjust the settings, where should I do it? If on both, where first? Thanks for providing excellent advice since DLTV, Dave. Woohoo! Thank Thanks you, for Dave. Watching, man. And this is kind of, you know, it doesn't have to be a DVDO Edge. It could be like, you know, do totally. you adjust your Blu-ray player? Exactly. Do you adjust settings inside of your media streaming box, or do you adjust them on the TV? Many, many things have built-in settings to control picture too quality. Many. The TV, too. <laughs> and Dave, your DVDO Edge is one sweet audio-video processor, and it also functions as an auto-switcher. And it does, as you noted, feature its own built-in picture controls, as well as built-in setup and test patterns, even. Uh, by default, the Edge acts as a neutral video source device, and it shouldn't alter the incoming video signal compared to feeding it directly to the TV. That's a big should, anyway. Now, most digital and HDMI source devices provide proper, accurate video output with those default settings, so I would first suggest uh, calibrating the HDTV. Now, once that's set up, your other connected devices may require very little or no further adjustment because generally speaking with HDMI output nowadays, with consumer devices I'm finding, they usually will put out a correct formatted signal for that uh, display device. And as you noted with the DVDO Edge, it does incorporate those setup features. So maybe if you had a device that didn't have any kind of picture adjustment and, and your calibrated display is still not looking right with one of your devices, that's where I would then go into the DVDO Edge and then make some tweaks in there with its new numerous picture controls. And again, if you're looking for an HDMI switcher, auto switcher with excellent video processing for older analog devices to make them work with newer hardware, the Edge is one product I've talked about a lot and shown off here. And if we ever want to look at it again, I'll bring one in to, to take a look at. But excellent hardware, but generally speaking, get the display calibrated first, then deal with connected device issues if they arise. Now, I want to say Derek in Beaumont, Texas emailed us this question about high quality sound. You guys mentioned lossless audio and that home theater enthusiasts should experience it. Which audio receiver support it? How do I look for it on a Blu-ray or a receiver to make sure it's on there? <laughs> Which Blu-ray players should we use as well? Uh, well, that's a great question. So a lossless audio track is any piece of encoded audio that is mathematically identical to the original source title. It's kind of like Apple lossless or FLAC or any of the other lossless audio formats. It's smaller than a CD, but it's basically has mathematical information to reconstruct all of the bits from the original format. For Blu-ray movies, there are several audio formats that can provide sound quality identical to the original Studio Master. These include Dolby True HD, DTS HDMA, um, but well, basically they are Dolby True HD or DTS HDMA. Those are the two options that that uh, you could also do a PCM decode or some right. of the some of the original Blu-ray discs had PCM audio as well. But. Generally speaking, though, yeah. it's going to be DTS or or Dolby True HD because those are the most supported across everything in the planet. 
both formats can push 7.1 channels of audio at up to 92 kilohertz, 24-bit sampling. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's, it is delightful stuff. Uh, and these are high-quality audio formats. They increase the data rate compared to previous formats. On Blu-ray, uh, for Dolby Digital, up to 640 kilobits per second. Uh, Dolby True HD, up to 18 megabytes per second. Megabit. That's like 20 megabit, pardon me. Megabit. I, you know, I'm so old. Megabyte would be things. ideal, but that's a lot of data. But you're talking about <laughs> 28 times as much data per second of audio. Uh, and the extra data is going to require you to use HDMI. Almost all Blu-ray players support Dolby True HD and DTS HDMA. The more expensive models can decode these tracks for analog output. For example, if you have an older five-channel uh, uh, amplifier that you really, really like, go to Oppo, spend the money for one of their Blu-ray players, and take the analog audio output from that and plug it into your high-end uh, amplifier. That's an exceptional. It's an incredible experience. It's also incredibly expensive compared to a $79 Blu-ray player that will do the same thing over HDMI. True. AVRs with HDMI switching can decode these sonically luscious tracks, his quote, uh, <laughs> pretty much from the entry level to super premium models. The information on this will be in your manual. It will be on the box. Uh, it will be on the description on Amazon.com or in the little card at Best Buy. Pretty much you're going to have to search out to make it. If you have a three-year-old Blu-ray player, it might not do uh, Dolby HD or, yeah. or, or, or DTS you know, HD. It might only but, be able to pass that signal out in a raw format of some kind. Um, but yeah. any newish Blu-ray player is going to support your lossless audio formats. Mm -hmm. Every AV receiver that I've seen made in the last couple of years supports decoding right. of these lossless formats uh, natively. So uh, once it's set up, you don't even have to think about it. If the, if the track is present on the disc and it starts feeding it right. to the AV receiver, the receiver will switch over, yeah. decode it, and feed it out to whatever number of speakers you're currently using. Uh, unless, so, of course, you're forcing your AVR to output in stereo mode to just your left and right front channels. But that's and okay, too. The that's the speakers. nice thing about the AVR. <laughs> it takes care of the number of speakers you have. So if you do have a 7.1 audio source and only two-channel audio up front, that's the beauty of the AVR. Yeah. It takes care of that for you. I just ran into that recently where somebody had managed to force their AVR into stereo mode. Oh. They're like, why doesn't the surround sound work? And well, I was like, click, 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 click. And that. 17 clicks later, it was back on. And then there's that seven channel stereo mode that I like a lot too. <laughs> I'm just saying, for radio sources. <laughs> <laughs> At DFish Design was the first to tweet us this simple message 4K Netflix! He's always quick with it. I love that. Hey, Netflix has apparently quietly slipped some 4K content into its streaming offerings, and of course, it's going to be. House of Cards. Shot in 4K, we knew that from CES. We knew the 4K titles were coming. Samsung, LG equipped HDTVs with H.265 decode support. Yeah, it's not available for everyone yet. No. Just those specific Samsung TVs that are not only 4K, but also have the H.265 decode support built in. Hey, here's the TV we're using. The Samsung F9000 series. We have the 55 inch 4K model. Complete with Netflix built in and H.265, and we've hit 1080 Super HD, but we're not yeah. getting the 4K stream yet. So apparently fast broadband, uh, you know, we're talking about like 16 megabits per second we plus were... to stream in 4K, uh, but I, I don't know if this TV isn't on the list yet or if they just haven't rolled it out in this part it. of California yet, but we have had no success playing House of Cards in 4K. Not yet, but it is doing Super HD now, and it did update the software again. Right. And in addition to House of Cards, they're going to have a couple of documentaries available as well. It should be still not for No, K. but you know what? I'm i got to say, the, uh, the 1080 Super HD does look pretty Great. damn good, I have yeah. to admit. I thought the 1080 looked okay, but the Super HD is even, even more luscious, you know, so to speak. If I pull up the voice search on Amazon, <laughs> it'll tell me I can buy <sighs> House of Cards for like $2.99 an episode, but it's yeah. not going to tell me that I can get it on Netflix. One last thing before we go, new Blu-rays, like we mentioned last week, The Hobbit, The Desolation of Small Blu-ray is out. Robert is not thrilled about that. He is, however, thrilled about the re-release of Sabrina on Blu-ray, an unbelievable classic, beautifully shot, uh, Oscar nominated for cinematography. The 400 Blows Criterion Collection, a classic piece of foreign cinema, The Night of the Hunter, Robert Mitchum scaring the hell out of the universe, Wild at Heart, uh, I just, this is, this is good stuff if you're into weird movies. 1990, that was a big impact on my college years. And strangely enough, Used Cars on Blu-ray, a 1980 comedy, uh, Kurt Russell, Mayhem, Used Cars, a lot of foul language. I love it. And it's odd. It's, it's, it's a limited edition of 3,000 units from the folks at Screen Archives Entertainment. I have no idea what that's about. Apparently, it's their own version of a Kickstarter. Maybe they're not going to sell it to you unless they can sell 3,000 in advance. All right, that's it for this edition of HD Nation. Please subscribe to Vision3.com slash HD Nation or YouTube.com slash HD Nation. Please, please, people, you know what to do. And email us your comments, your questions, or your suggestions. or HD post Nation at revision3.com.
or post them right down below. At HD Nation. <laughs> yeah, if you're on YouTube. And tweet us if you like to. Hey, and until next time, thank you so much for watching. Tell your friends about HD Nation. Where'd my picture go? Oh, there's Ben. It's Still right there. not 4K. No.